I'm Terry. This is Vicki. We want to share Jeremiah 29, 13 with you. It says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Happy, Happy Sunday. Sunday. Hey guys, what you doing? Oh, oh. Hi. Oh man, I miss my friends from Forum so much. I just, I thought this might help. I've been looking for them and looking for them. I, I miss them too. Don't worry, we'll all be together again soon. Yay! Yay. Hi everybody! Hi, Hi everybody! Hello, Hello from the Stevens! We miss, we miss you. you! Good morning everyone, my name's Nick. Um, just like in Acts chapter 4 verse 20, how the disciples could not stop telling about the amazing things that they had seen and heard about, um, we continue to proclaim that message today. Excited to worship alongside you online. Hey, we're the Petersons. We look forward to seeing you. And for all you kiddos, we miss praise and worship with you guys. Bye. Bye. Hi, everybody. We're so glad you've joined us for our digital gathering. Over the next hour, we're going to have a chance to sing, listen to God's word, and take communion together. While we're not physically in the same place, we are a big church meeting in small groups. So let me encourage you to create, as best you can, a distraction-free environment and stand with us as we begin.
2,000 years ago, a very small group of people ignited a movement that would reach the entire world. Over time, and as the movement spread, they became known as the Church. We are that church, a movement of people carrying forward the mission and vision of our founder and leader even to this day. This movement is still moving, still spreading, and still changing nations and cultures, one person at a time. Hi everybody, we're so glad you're joining us. However you're tuning in, we're glad that you're here. My name is Bradley, I'm one of the pastors here at Forum. Uh, before we jump into today's message, I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, to so many of you who are making a difference in uh, your homes and in this community from medical professionals to police officers to firefighters to people who are working in the city helping to innovate and, and re-engineer uh, ways that we can get back uh, to some sense of, of normalcy. And I'm really excited as even the narrative begins to change from um, what a lockdown looks like to, to reopening. Uh, so thankful uh, for where we are and so thankful to so many of you who are being generous with your time and your energy and your resources. And, uh, you know, there's so many of you right now who are giving so generously to the ministry. And because of that, we're able to help people put food on the table. We're able to help put clothes on people's backs and shoes on their feet, help them with transportation, help them out. Uh, in a really difficult season, all because of your generosity. So, so thank you for that. And I want you to know, like, uh, when you give to the Ministry of Forum, it doesn't just stay local. It goes to state and national levels. And uh, you're, you're helping uh, people in Taiwan when you give to Forum, as we have uh, Anna Fletcher in the Home of God's Love, an, uh, an orphanage in Taiwan, and people in China and in India and in Ireland and across the world all because of your generosity. So we're so thankful. We partner with over 30 different ministry organizations across the world, really with the same mission of taking the message of Jesus to the ends of the earth. So thank you for partnering with us in that. It's really part of the, you know, really the stories that I love to hear is how we are really kind of looking at not necessarily the things that have been taken away from us, because that's a real thing, but considering what is this opportunity affording us? And I'm hearing these stories all the time from across the world, and some of them uh, so, so powerfully just here locally. I had a chance to visit with a friend just the other day, and he was telling me that one of the things him and his wife are doing is they're pulling out uh, their little fire pit, and they're bringing it, and they're setting it in their driveway at, at, towards the evening when everybody starts walking around in their neighborhood. And they thought, why don't we just pull the fire pit out and, and put some lawn chairs out, you know, six feet apart from each other, and then as people are walking by, just invite them to come and sit by the fire. And I think that is a fantastic story. That's, that's a fantastic way to leverage the current situation, to not necessarily think, hey, you know, so much has been taken away or so much is missing, but to think, man, what, what kind of opportunities do we have now that we didn't have before? I was talking to somebody and they, they, were, they were communicating how in their neighborhood they hadn't met their neighbors and it's, it's been years and years until recently as people have been home, had been working out in the yard, and been taking walks, and they got to meet them. And there are so many great things happening in the midst of this current challenge. And so let me just encourage you, keep finding ways to reach people and to connect with others, because those small steps that you take, they can, have a, they can make a big difference. And when we start doing that together, uh, we're, we're, we're just seeing over and over again how God is using what's going on now to create beautiful things, things you would have never thought were even possible. God, that's what God does. With, with God, all things are possible. And we're so thankful for that. So I want to say thank you before we jump into uh, the big idea for today. You know, one of the things uh, I've been on, on so many uh, calls with people, uh, other ministries, uh, other pastors here in town, just kind of figure out how are we going to do this reentry thing and how are we going to do it well, working with city officials and other organizations here in town. What, what does that look like for us? And those are really important conversations to have. But what I love about it is it's a conversation about how we are going to reenter, how we are going to reengage and what it looks like to come back together and how can we how can we do that really well? And that's an important conversation to happen. I just want to give you a little preview. As a ministry team, uh, we've spent the last three weeks really focused in on what that reentry plan looks like. And as we formulate those details and as we get those plans out to some 
to some of the leadership here at Forum. We're, we're going to make that public and everybody's going to be able to know uh, what our plan is. So stay tuned for all of that as we, as we consider what coming back together looks like. I'm really, really, really uh, looking forward to that. You know, I was uh, talking to a, a friend who's in, who serves in a different ministry and we were talking about the things our churches were doing and how we were trying to stay connected with people. And he was talking about one of the things that they did is they changed their teaching series really kind of right in the middle as COVID started to kind of shut cities and churches down because they wanted to really help people understand what's God's perspective on these things. And I, I love to hear that people adapting, people changing and, and thinking it through it through the lens of what is God saying? How can we center our lives on that? And one of the things I, I love to be able to say in that same conversation was, we didn't, we didn't have to change the series that we were in. We, we didn't have to change the teaching because months and months ago we had planned during this season to be in a, a series called Big Church. And this whole, this whole series is designed around the reality that God's design for the church was, was never a building. It, it's always been a people, right? And I've been, I've been kind of saying it like this, that we, we don't go to church. Uh, we are the church. And to think uh, 2,000 years ago, Jesus and just a handful of followers in Jerusalem would, in 2,000 years, go from something really small, something really local, to something 2,000 years later is, is global with over a billion people. Like that, okay, that went from very small to a really big church. And so when we say church, we're not talking buildings, we're talking people. And so what we're doing as we focus in this series is, is how, does, how, did God, how did God create that big church? How did it go from a handful of people to now over a billion? And more specifically, looking at in order to become that big church, there, there were some big changes that needed to occur. And when we see the resurrection of Jesus and the pouring out of God's Spirit, this is there's some cataclysmic changes that took place. And so each week in this series, we're really just kind of unpacking what were some of those big changes that needed to occur. So like we started off this, this whole series really looking at, we're studying through the book of Acts chapters 1 and 2, and we saw very early on one of the big changes that needed to occur was there needed to be a change in focus. And I, I think, you know, this series is, is relevant to so many of us because what we see happening in the lives of these early followers of Jesus really is, I think, an invitation for us to stop and consider, maybe that's some change that needs to happen in my life. You know, and if you think about their focus was already getting off like the disciples were already thinking, Jesus has come back from the dead. Oh, when are we going to set up the kingdom? What, what are things going to look like for us? And he just shifts their perspective. It's like, I need you to focus here on this really big mission that I'm going to give you. And then like we saw last week, after the, he, he gives them this, this clarity around what they should be focusing on, he says, listen, you need to go to Jerusalem and wait because I'm going to empower you to carry out this mission. So the, the big change that needed to happen was their focus and it also was the Spirit. And this is a really big change. And, I, and I'm so thankful how Tyler sort of helped us understand the way that God ushered in His Spirit, doing extraordinary things through, through ordinary people. Like that was God's method for bringing this hope into the world in a really powerful way. Because here's the thing, like if, if you think about how God used the Spirit in, throughout the entire Old Testament, there there are these pockets, there are these moments. He's interacting, sending his spirit upon some prophets, speaking through them upon kings and, and priests, isolated incidents, isolated moments. But there were, there were these, these prophecies that foretold that in the future it was going to be different. God was going to send his spirit out in a really powerful way. Things were going to need to change and one of the ways that God was going to do that was by ushering in His Spirit, right? So that's where we were last week. So today we're going to follow up and we're really going to look and see what was a big change that needed to happen. We've already seen focus. We've already seen Spirit. And today we're going to look more specifically at another one. And we're going to pick up right where we left off last week in Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 11. I'd love it if you get your Bibles out. This is definitely the kind of series where you're going to want to follow along in your Bible. So pause this, go get your Bible, and get out your phone. You probably got your phone in your hand. Come on, let's be serious. And open up your Bible app, right? Put your email away, put social media away. Let's just 
for a second. Let's engage with God's word. Acts chapter 2, verse 11. Let me just kind of give you a preview of where we've been like last week on Big Church. Here's, here's, here's what we saw. We saw God sending his spirit in such a powerful way that, that it sounded like this rushing wind as the disciples are gathered together and it's like it's fire above their heads and they're instantly empowered to proclaim, to be a witness, to, to share the message of Jesus. And, and it was happening at a time in Jerusalem where there was a really big party going on and people from all over had come into town. And so you got people who are speaking different languages and from different parts of, of the state and the city and, and, and the region. And so when the spirit breaks out and the, these early apostles start speaking the message of Jesus, the people in the crowd start hearing it in their own language. And it, and it has a really profound impact on that crowd. And that's right where I want to jump in today in Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 12. The crowd's standing there in amazement, and they're perplexed, asking, what can this mean? Now, that's a really important phrase. I'm going to highlight that here really quickly and stop for just a second. They're amazed and perplexed. They, they are seeing in front of them a demonstration of a supernatural action, and they're just asking, I think, a really, really important question. What does this mean? Now, we're going to see here in just the next verse, we're going to see another part of the crowd reacting very differently to this action of God. But I want us to just kind of hold in our minds this idea. Okay, what does this mean? I love that because it's like, there are certain people in the crowd who see the activity of God and they are searching for meaning in the midst of, of the divine activity. And yet there are some in the crowd who ridiculed them, saying they're drunk. That's all that's happening. The only thing that's happening is you got a bunch of people who are wasted and are, and are yapping a bunch of gibberish. That's all that's happening. Now, stop and think about that for just a second. You have a certain portion of the crowd sees a demonstration of the divine power. It amazes them. It doesn't make sense. And so they ask a right question. What does this mean? Search for meaning. And then you have these other people who are, see the same thing, same experience. And yet they're, they're going to they're mock them. They're going to ridicule them. And I want us to think just for a second and look at the contrast that the author here, Luke, also the Spirit of God who ultimately inspired this text, is helping us to see. And, and I think it's something that you and I, we, we should pretty easily relate with because when there is this movement and activity of God, that doesn't mean everybody's just going to be like, oh, oh, wow, and everybody just believes and has faith. No, people were seeing the same divine supernatural outbreak, they were having very different responses. Some saw it as the activity of God. Others were trying to label it with, with some sort of like human component. Why is that? Why do you think that is? And I think, you know, I can, I can just think back into my own life. There are these moments where I knew God was doing something in my life. I knew it. And the people around me could see a change. They could see something different. And I, I can remember this so vividly. I, I remember this one guy. Because here's the thing. Like when, when I met Jesus and when I began to follow Jesus, he showed me the areas of my life that I needed to repent of. And when I say repentance, I mean like turn away from. And that's what that term repentance, it means like a turning, like a 180 degree turn, kind of like an about face from the direction that you were going. And so that was happening in my life. I just knew there were some things that I was doing, some crowds that I was hanging out with and some things that were going on. I needed to turn from. And so when I made that turn, you can guarantee there were some people in that community that I was a part of that were going, what are you doing? And I'll never forget this one guy. He looks at me with like this, this disdain in his face. And he's like, oh, what are you? A, are you a Bible boy? And the reason why I remember this, that sounds so ridiculous to me. Even now, this has been years and years. Because I remember thinking to myself like, 
Bible boy, like, what is that, like a boy band for like people who follow Jesus? But I can remember him saying that and that look on his face. It was like he was disgusted that I was going to make some changes for the better of my life. Because he wasn't looking at that through the lens of what was best for me. He was looking at that through the lens of what that said about him. And I think that's an important point to make. And there may be something going on in your life right now that God is absolutely at work. And the people in your life, they may see it and they'll use it as an excuse to ridicule you and to mock you and to make fun of you. And I don't know about you, like, like this is how it is for me. Like when I think people are talking about me behind my back and sometimes because I, you know, I have a tendency to stand on stage usually uh, with large groups of people all staring at me with, and I got a microphone and a spotlight on me and I could see out into the crowd. Sometimes when I see people like lean over and whisper, whoosh, 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 how can you not think in that moment they're talking about me? Oh, did I say something? Did they just get offended, right, really quickly? And we can start to retreat. And so, uh, you know, one of the things I really, really love about these digital services is that we can just kind of think about an idea and just press pause and then talk about it with the people who are in the room with you. And so I'm going to encourage you to do that. Number one, with just maybe... Uh, tell the story of a time when, when you felt like God was doing something powerful in your life, but you got made fun of for it. And then at the same time, here's the second part. I want you to think about a time when maybe you saw something going on in somebody's life that was for the better. And maybe you said something that pulled them down. Maybe you didn't say it out of your mouth because I think sometimes as Christians, we get really good at just thinking it and feeling it in our heart, seeing God do something in somebody's life. Like a friend of mine recently uh, just, just, just celebrated a, an anniversary from an addiction that they're struggling with. And, and listen to all my people who are in uh, addiction recovery right now. Listen, you're going to reach some of those milestones, and there's just going to be hecklers in your life who are going to look at you and say, oh, that's not going to last, or oh, they're going to relapse again. Listen, don't listen to those voices. Because sometimes those voices, they can be deafening. And I want to just challenge all of us, not just to think about moments when we've been mocked or ridiculed. I just want us to think about times that maybe you've been the one doing it. So I'm going to put these questions up here on the screen for everybody to think about. To share the story of a time when you were mocked or ridiculed. And also think of a time when you were mocked or ridiculed and you did that, you did that to somebody else. All right, so maybe that generated a little bit of conversation. Maybe you got to hear a story from somebody in the room that you didn't even know that that had happened. And I think that should serve in some way to help all of us realize uh, in this journey of faith that we're on, uh, there are going to be times when we don't make super great decisions and that we actually need a community around us to, to help us, to encourage us, to stand beside us, not to tear us down, not to, not to ridicule, not to mock, but, but to be a source of like hope and encouragement, right? This is what I see Jesus doing with his disciples all the time. They made a lot of mistakes. They said a lot of dumb stuff. They did a lot of dumb stuff. But he was right there with them, teaching them, training, pouring into them. And that made all the difference in their lives. Now, as we walk through these next couple verses, I really want us to pay attention to what Peter does, right? Because... This would have been really easy for somebody to retreat. You know, you got this crowd of people, God's doing something powerful, and now they're making fun of you. Watch what Peter does. And I want us to really look at two things. Okay, the content of what he's going to say, and then how he does it. Because this is going to help us to see some things. Watch, watch what happens next. Then, verse 14, Peter stepped forward with the eleven and shouts to the crowd. I love this. He, he steps into it. He steps forward into the ridicule and the mockery. The text says in verse 14, he says, Listen carefully, all of you, fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem, those who are visiting and those who are locals, I need you to listen to what I'm about to say and make no mistake about this. And now that... Now that is a bold statement 
Because in a lot of ways, Peter's like, hey, everybody listen up. Let me, let me bring some clarity for all of you who are getting some wrong ideas about what's going on. He steps forward. He does this with, with courage and with boldness. That's a step of faith to bring clarity to this situation. And I think this is a great example for you and I. And I want to say it like this. Peter stepped forward and brought clarity to this, this really important situation. Now, we've got to take a step back and look at all the things that's happening. You know, Jesus resurrected, tells his disciples, I got this really big mission. I want you to go to Jerusalem and wait because I'm going to empower you with my spirit. And what's the first thing the spirit does? Empowering people to declare this truth, this revelation. And the instant the Spirit of God let loose in the hearts of man, it starts to produce a good thing. Instantly the hecklers come out. But the Spirit of God, moving through Peter, he steps forward in faith and says, Listen, let me, let me set the record straight. Nobody miss what's about to happen. These people... These people aren't drunk, as some of you are assuming. It's 9 o'clock in the morning. It's a little early for that. Now, what, what, what you see was something that was predicted long ago from the prophet Joel. Now, let's listen to the content and think about how he's doing this. Because he's going to go back to this ancient prophecy from the prophet Joel. So he's going back over 700 years to a time in Israel's history when they had been decimated by locusts, like a pandemic of locusts ravaging the land, eating the harvests. Think about how difficult it would have been just to survive with a land covered in locusts. And Joel, Joel helps everybody understand, listen, You've turned away from the things of God and you're suffering and you're hurting right now. Joel points to this moment in the future and Peter says that moment over 700 years ago that was prophesied about is happening right now. Because in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters are going to prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men are going to have dreams. In those days, I'm going to pour out my spirit even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. Now, I'm going to go back to verse 17. Do you see that word? Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Now again, verse 18. Men and women alike are going to prophesy. When we think of that word prophecy, often we think of the future telling, the forecasting, and there's a little bit of that, but the majority of prophecy was the revelation of God coming through a human agent to the people of God. It's the primary language of the prophets. And Peter's like, don't, don't you see the Spirit getting poured out right now? God is revealing a truth to you. And it was long foretold, and it's happening right now. Think about this. In this moment, right here, what's happening? As some people perplexed and amazed, wondering, what does this mean? What is God doing? And some people ridiculing and mocking Peter, the Spirit, inspiring Peter to step forward and set the record straight. This is a fulfillment of prophecy. How does Peter do that? How does he bring clarity to this moment? He does it with the revelation and the truth that comes from God. He doesn't launch into an all-out assault in defense of their character and whether or not, I've never had a drink in my whole life. They don't go into any of that. It's like, let me help you understand what God's Word says. You know what that reminds me of? That reminds me of what Jesus did. Also connected to the Spirit when He was baptized by John in the Jordan, and he comes up out of the water. The crowd there, they see the Spirit of God descend on him. It looked kind of like a bird. And then, you know what happens right after that? The Spirit leads him into the wilderness for 40 days, no food or water. At the end of that, he's then tempted by the devil. And how does Jesus respond to that temptation? 
Mm -hmm. We're actually going to see this becomes a pattern in the life of the earliest followers of Jesus. They become rooted and grounded in the revelation that comes from God. It's the, it's the foundation that they're going to stand on and it's going to allow them to stand firm amidst opposition, amidst the ridicule, amidst people making fun of them, against the temptations. What are they going to do? They're going to go stand on the Word of God. Now watch what he does next. People of Israel, listen. God publicly endorsed Jesus the Nazarene by doing powerful miracles, wonders, and signs through him, as you well know. He's like saying, okay, listen, what's happening right now? The Spirit of God's being poured out. Listen, and he's driving to this main point. And all of this, this is really about Jesus. And God demonstrated that Jesus was the Son of God, endorsed. You could see it. It was public. This wasn't hidden. Signs, miracles, and wonders. They get to see it. And he's like, you know this. You saw this. And I can't help but, but think, and we're going to sort of tie all this together. They saw it. The Son of God literally walking the earth, demonstrating His divine power. Not only did they not see it, Watch what Peter says next. God, God knew what was going to happen. Knew Jesus was going to be betrayed. And you nailed him to a cross and you killed him. I mean, he goes, Peter goes for the jugular right here. It's like, let, let's talk about the real issue. I know you want to get caught up in all this kind of stuff. Now, that's the spirit of God at work. The real issue is Jesus was here, the Son of God, and you played a part in stringing him up on a cross. But I love it how Peter makes sure everybody understands. Catch this in verse 23. God knew exactly what was going to happen. This, this, nothing was outside of the sovereignty of God. And so I want to stop here just for a second because I think this opens up a really important question that I want us to just consider. Maybe this is just, you know, you're driving in the car, listening to the podcast, and you're watching this on social media. Maybe you got some people in the room with you. Just turn to them and just consider, okay, so if they saw signs and wonders and miracles, and they, they saw Jesus bring people back from the dead, and give sight to the blind. And God was publicly endorsing him. Why did they reject him? I mean, if it was all on display, how could they crucify him? How does that make sense? How can some people see it as the activity of God and some people just utterly reject it? Why is that? I want, I want to ask that question. If Jesus was publicly and powerfully endorsed by God, why was he rejected and crucified? I just want you to talk about that for a second. Pause this video and we'll come back together and finish out this text. I would love to hear some of your answers. Uh, right now, because we pre-record this message, I am sitting on my couch like I have done for the past month in my pajamas. <laughs> And I'm sitting next to my wife and I got a cup of coffee and I've got my phone out. And we've uploaded this message to Facebook. I would love to hear your answers. Uh, and maybe if, if, you don't, if you don't have any answers to this, maybe just jump on social media, say, hey, uh, let us know you're here. Maybe it's a great, great place to submit any prayer requests. Uh, just something that I could pray for you and we could just interact. Just say hi. Uh, jump on there. I would really love to know some of your thoughts. Why? Why did people reject Jesus? They got to see so much of God's love and power on display. And I can't help it, you know, uh, last week, uh, you know, we, my, my wife and I just recently moved into an older home that we had to do some, some remodeling to. And in the process, uh, there's just certain parts of our yard that just, that just got destroyed. I mean, they were basically just mud pits. And so uh, we reseeded those areas and put some straw down. And um, so at numerous occasions, I'm out walking in the yard, finding those dead spots and just taking handfuls of grass seed. And I'm just tossing them around, filling in those holes. And I was out there actually with, with, with my middle son, Maddox, and I just thought, Maddox, you remember that story that Jesus told about the farmer and the seed? And he was kind of like, 
uh, the ones with birds came and ate the seed. I'm like, yeah, that's exactly the one. And I can't help but think about that in this moment. Why, why, why did so many people reject something so beautiful? And I think it has something to do with why they may reject and mock all the beautiful things that God may be doing in your life. And it may also be an indication of your heart right now. If you find yourself, maybe you don't even want to admit it, being critical and pulling other people down, that may say something about your heart because Jesus tells the story of a farmer who casts seed. And seed is the word of God and the soil represented people's hearts. And, and in that story, Jesus says, you know, there's all kinds of different people and different hearts. And some people's hearts are so hard, the word, it can't even pierce down into it. It just sits up on the surface and it's easy for the devil to come and snatch that away. Some, it falls among the rocks, some upon the thorns, but, but some of it falls on, on good soil. And I think that's, that's one of the primary reasons why people rejected Jesus. Their hearts had been so hardened to the things of God for so long. When God showed up right in front of them, they couldn't even recognize him. And I just want to, man, I just want to stop right here and say, let, let's not be those people. Let's not let our hearts get so hardened to the things of God. Let's not just get so downcast about everything that's going on where we can no longer see the good that God is doing. Let's, let's stop looking at things in terms of what's being taken away from us and let's begin to think, God, what, what is this opportunity that God has given me and how can I use it to make a difference? Now, let's come back, let's come back into our text. In verse 23, God knew what was going to happen. And with the help of the lawless Gentiles, you nailed him to the cross, and you killed him. This is a really important text, but God, but God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life because death could not keep him in its grip. Think about this. Peter's like, listen, the human response to the activity of God was murder. That's what we did. But that's not what God was going to do. The divine response to the murder of Jesus was the resurrection. So in the, in, in the face of human hatred, God demonstrated the ultimate display of love and life and vitality and invitation in the face, up against execution God shows us resurrection. Now we're getting, we've, we've seen the content of Peter's sermon here. We're going to get into part two of this sermon next week. But just here on the front, he's like, listen, this is the work of the Spirit and this Jesus who you killed. God brought back to life because death has no hold on him. Now just think about this for one second. What if, what if Peter... What if his actions, what if his words, what if his boldness, what if he never took that step of faith because he was too afraid of people's reactions? It's one of the things that I love about this passage. It helps us to see Peter's message was not dependent on people's reactions. And this is something I think you and I, we have a lot to learn from. Not just what Peter said, but, but how he did it. He stepped forward in faith boldly declaring the truth about who Jesus is. And that was not dependent on what other people were going to do or how they were going to react or how they were going to respond. And we're going to see in a couple weeks, there are going to be some people who respond to this message in a really powerful way. But how many of, of, of the things that you say and do, especially in regards to your faith, are absolutely determined by what you think other people are going to say? So many of us, we live in fear based upon what we think other people are going to say, based upon what we think they're going to say. It's like we're playing predictive prophet, trying to foretell the future. And so we see something that needed to change. They needed a change in focus. They needed a change in spirit. But they needed a change in understanding God was calling them to be a witness. I love this. I don't want us to miss this. This needed to change in their life. Because they went from being witnesses, 
like watching, seeing, like bystanders. What's Jesus doing? What's he going to do next? How are people going to respond? Oh my goodness, I can't believe all of this is happening to Jesus saying, now you are going to go and tell others what you've seen and what you've heard and what you've experienced. And on day one, the Spirit gets poured out. What do you see him doing? Being a witness. That needed to be a big change in their life. That's how they were going to go from a, a small group of Jesus followers in Jerusalem to, to over a billion Christians across the world because they needed to be the witness. And I think this is just one of those areas there's so much relevance and application into your life and mine because I know for so many of us, we shrink back from taking big steps of faith. We, we shrink back from taking steps of being a witness. And maybe right now, we can stop looking at all the stuff that's been taken away from us and start looking at these as opportunities. Maybe God has given me a brand new opportunity with my family and with my neighbors to be a witness, to be willing to step out in faith and share what God is doing. Look at what God has done in my life, and maybe it's time to stop making excuses that we're afraid of what people are going to say. You listen, I can guarantee you somebody's going to make fun of you because of your faith. So what? Let's be willing to be made fun of because we worship a resurrected Jesus who gave up his life for us. Would you be willing to sacrifice your, reputa your reputation for the risen one? What would you be willing to give up for Jesus? He was willing to give up his life. And sometimes I think if we're really honest, we would be terrified at the reality that we sacrifice faith to save face with people. We don't want to hear people whispering about us, and we sacrifice our witness for that. There needs to be a big change in your life and my life when it comes to being a witness. And so this is going to be my encouragement to you today. This is also going to be my prayer for us as we close out today. I just pray God is, God is leading us to be bold, to step forward in our faith. N not so that we can say, hey, look how great we are, look at what God is doing in my life, but to say, hey, God is real. And it's something that you can experience. And me sharing that story with you is, is just one way I know this is what God's calling me to do and step out in faith. And so that's going to be my prayer. Not only that we would step out in faith, but that he would give us opportunities to do so. So let's pray together. Our God and Father, for, forgive us. Forgive us for our frailty and, and our weakness and how we often shrink back from those opportunities you, you, you put in front of us. And I pray, God, you forgive us. We, we have been, we've been in, this, in this roller coaster, this whirlwind of a, a global situation and, and we've forgotten to stand firm and steady upon your words. So I pray, God, draw us back to the center of it all. Help us to learn not only from the content of what Peter was preaching, but from how he did it. That empowered by your spirit, he drove everything to the reality of who your son was. And that death had no hold on him. I, pr I pray that just breathes new life and hope into us today and that it would, it would motivate us, it would inspire us. I pray, God, for more boldness for your people to be a witness. I know, God, we, we need to do a better job of that. But we don't want to do it in our own strength, leaning on our own understanding. So we're coming to you now and asking, God, would you give us another opportunity to be a witness for your son, Jesus, and by your spirit so boldly move in our lives that we would step out in faith regardless of the ridicule that we may face. So thankful for your son, Jesus, who makes it all possible. Thankful for your word and thankful for this community that is thriving in the midst of a global pandemic. And God, we are looking forward to the time when we can gather together again and lift up our voices in unison and praise and worship to you. God, we are praying that comes soon. And all God's people said, amen. beginning one with God the Lord most high your hidden glory and creation now revealed in you our Christ what a beautiful name it is what a beautiful name 
favorite things about today's text is it reveals a simple yet profound strategy employed by Peter in this moment. You see there was mass confusion and differing opinions as to what was really going on. And so Peter, he steps in and he takes the opportunity to center everyone's focus and view on Jesus. Now here's my question. When things are confusing or you're uncertain or maybe life is getting foggy, where do you turn? I think all of us can learn from Peter in this moment and realize that when we are searching for clarity, the best place for you and I to go is Jesus. And that's why I love this time of communion because that's exactly what it does for us. It gives us the opportunity to stop and reflect and center our hearts and minds around who Jesus is, what he did for us on the cross, 
and what he's continuing to do and desires to do in and through us. Now, I'll be honest, this is one of those weeks where I need this moment more than any other week because it, it, it just one thing piled on after the other, and before I knew it, my priorities and, and my focus became divided. So would you join in with me in recentering our hearts and our minds to Jesus? Because as he becomes the center of our heart and our mind, everything else comes into focus. Let's pray. God, you are so good. You are so perfect and holy. And God, I am so thankful that as we take the bread and the juice that signifies and exemplifies your blood and, and, and body broken for us, God, I pray that we remember who you are. And that as we prioritize and center our hearts around you, our lives would come into focus. God, we want to glorify you and seek you in all that we do. It's in Jesus' name I pray.
praise our hearts will crack these bones will sing glad you joined us this morning. If there's anything we can do to help you connect to God, if you have a prayer request or you have a need that we can help meet, please visit us at forumchristian.org. Have a great week and we look forward to seeing you soon.